Um, so uh, let's continue with our discussion of the divergences. Uh, you remember in the last class, we studied the following Euclidean action. Um, and uh, we decided to compute the expectation value of phi 1 x1 by phi of x1, phi of x4. In this theory, we move to Fourier space to do the calculation. We can be able to Fourier transform of the subject. And uh, one of the contributions in perturbation theory, uh, the leading connected contribution in order along that square, we come to understand what these terms mean a bit, it turned out to be lambda squared by 2, 1 by, um, so what we did was, since we had, we will make this Feynman graph, um, if P was the momentum flowing through the Feynman graph, if we want that P to is equal to minus P3 plus P4, we got 1 over half squared plus seven squared, all is the loop moment. Um, okay. And we noticed that this object was divergent uh, in for d greater than 4. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so we, you know, we, we were wondering what to do with this. Okay. Uh, so this lecture will start trying to understand how to make sense of quantum field theory. So, point as I explained last time, quantum field theory is not defined just by a path integral, but it's defined by a cutoff path integral, where the parameters of the Lagrangian are functions of the cutoff, and the cutoff is eventually taken to infinity with the parameters scaled with the cutoff in a particular way. And we're going to try to understand this. Okay. Uh, so we're going to try to understand this <coughs> following this beautiful paper by Polchinski. You know, when I was a student, I was studying trying to understand quantum field theory. Um, this business of renormalization just didn't make any sense. You know, I, I read uh, Bjorken and Dredd, then I read Itzik and Zuba, you know, those among books. And uh, uh, everything I said just didn't seem to make, it seemed like completely disconnected from the rest of the books, you know, that way of thinking. It didn't make any sense to me. I've, I first felt I understood what was going on when I read this paper by Polchinski. So why I'm introducing the subject in this way. Okay. Um, okay, excellent. So let's so let's go. So as we've seen, a, a diagram like this can lead to a can lead to divergence. This divergence comes from the ultraviolet. By which I mean that some intermediate some intermediate particle momentum in a final graph like this one. Okay, it's becoming very large. By the way, this writing perturbation theory in terms of Feynman graphs and so on, that's of course familiar to you people. Uh, I did that very fast last time. Were there any questions about that, that mechanical stuff? Are there any questions before we... Okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, so we had this, uh, this divergence where one of the intermediate momenta is uh, going very large. That was the, the path that contributed Just as an aside, suppose if m was equal to zero. Okay. Um, uh, suppose m was equal to zero, uh, then there are Feynman graphs that will give you divergences from the other end. Namely, they yeah, are r equals zero. Okay? The, there are two kinds of divergences that can occur in Feynman diagrams. Actually, it's three kinds, right? Okay, there's, there are divergences where, okay, yeah, uh, in Euclidean space, there are two kinds. The, uh, the, 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 the divergences where a very large momentum divergence a very small momentum. In Minkowski's case, it's, it's basically, it can sometimes see, seem like there's a third kind of divergence where the momentum goes on shape. Intermediate momentum goes on shape. We'll talk about all these things as we go. Okay, but uh, these are very conceptually very different things. Okay, the divergences. At low momenta, called um, infrared divergences, and are some real thing 
Okay? They're not to be dealt with by changing your definition of the theory. They represent a real physical phenomenon. And they tell you something about what's going on in the theory. On the other hand, these ultraviolet divergences, divergence happening in very high energies. Okay? Um, uh, divergence happening in very high energies uh, need to be dealt with. Now, before we start actually technically dealing with this, um, let, let us see what the main worry is. You see, what this suggests is that the Lagrangian, as we wrote it down, does not define, does not give us a well-defined path in time. And that is true. What it also suggests is that in order to get well-defined path in time, we need to modify the Lagrangian at very high energies. Okay? Because, you know, you get a ultraviolet divergence, you need to do something at very high energies. And some, uh, some of you might be thinking, well, okay, it's not unreasonable. After all, we work at some energy scale when we're doing, when we're doing physics. Um, writing down this Lagrangian and pretending that it works at every energy scale is surely fantasy. Okay? When we come to, I don't know, say we're writing down the Lagrangian for QED, we come to the scale of the LHC. It's modified on the other energy. So we write down the Lagrangian of the standard model, we go to some other scale back, so blank scale. We modify this, then we call it gravity. Okay? So, okay, fine. If, if there are ultraviolet divergences, some ultraviolet effect comes and cures it. And that may be, that may well be the, the case. But the issue is then, uh, what a practicality. Is it the case that in order to do physics at any given energy scale, like our energy scale, we need to know everything arbitrarily accurately. We need to know the details of what's happening at the blank scale. If that were the case, it's possibly logically consistent story, but it would probably mean the end of physics. Because it's very unlikely that human beings will ever get the full theory of elements. And if details of what's happening here depend, you know, on the spectrum of the hydrogen atoms, depends on the details. In a detailed way, what's happening at the blank scale. In order to get the hydrogen atom right, we'd have had to know the whole theory all at once. And okay, now, you know, we're limited creatures. It's unlikely we do that. Okay? So the issue is not so much one of, okay, this makes ultraviolet modifications to deal with it. The, the issue is if that's the case then can we still have predictability without knowing too much about the ultraviolet physics? And the correct thing about quantum field theory is that the answer to that question is yes. Okay? That even though we have to modify this naive definition of the theory in a way that in some sense is sensitive to the ultraviolet, what we're going to try to say in this lecture is that having done that, we can hide our ignorance of what happens in the ultraviolet in a few, in few fudge parameters. Okay? So we get a predictive theory because one or two parameters allow us to predict the number of numbers. Independent of the details of what's happening, okay, only a little bit of information about what's happening in the ultraviolet will survive. That's, that's the end. Okay, so, so this is where we're trying to go. So now let's get off this philosophical uh, uh, mode and start uh, looking at everything. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to take our path integral and turn it into a well-defined path integral. So we already took one step to that towards that way for the Euclidean space and the integration. But it wasn't good enough, we see the divergences. So let's, just as a mathematical uh, device, we find a regulated path integral. Okay? Now, roughly speaking, what we want to do is to cut off all loop momenta at some fixed scale lambda. Okay. But we want to do that in a nice and systematic way. So, uh, what we do is the following. Let's go, let's take this Lagrangian, whatever it is, and modify it in the following way. Suppose, we write this in momentum space, so let's take a 5b m squared plus b squared to 5 minus b. And we multiply this by the following form. k of b squared by one. And then we add the interaction. I'm going to be more allow myself to be more, uh, um, more, uh, uh, more general than 
than uh, uh, what uh, let me look here. I'll put an arbitrary interacting in This interacting advantage could be anything. Uh, it doesn't have this quadratic piece that we know about. Okay, but instance, this could be fine. Now this function k here, okay, uh, this function now is a function of action as a function of the pi and of lambda, which is lambda the Lambda is an object with dimension mass. And let me choose this function k okay, to be of the following form. Let me choose the function k to be of the following form. Um, k, uh, k is a function of x, if I plot it, it's a function of its argument. It's some function that at 1 is 1. Sorry, at 0 is 1. And uh, uh, goes strictly to 0. Um, at some number of order one, the next two is conscious. Oh, it doesn't matter. That it takes this general form. Okay? And we will also choose it to be everywhere differentiable, even though it goes strictly to 0 after this. You know, this is possible too. What? No, this is the graph of k. Okay? Now we'll see why. So let's say that this is 1, 2, doesn't matter, some number of order 1 and close to 0. Now, what is the effect of, of this quantitative approach? The effect is entirely in changing the product. The propagator of the inverse of the x squared by k squared. And the new propagator is k of p squared by lambda squared. Notice that because of our choice of uh, uh, it's k rather than k inverse because of, for the propagator you have to invert. Okay. Um, notice that for the for this choice of k, what happens is that the propagator vanishes for p larger than lambda times some number of order. Okay. So if we were to recompute this graph with this action with this the same lambda phi to the form, or we would get as a factor of k of r squared by lambda squared, k of r plus p squared by lambda squared. And clearly now there's no divergence. So then r becomes large enough, p vanishes. Okay? So this action here, this action here, this modified action here, is called a cutoff action. It defines up an effectively cutoff path there. Because k is 1 here, for when where the energy is much, much less than the scale lambda, our cutoff action is the same as the original action. Okay? At p much, much less than lambda. This object is one, and the cutoff action is much much less than the original. What? Whether one or two are different. Yeah, we can make it go to zero. It doesn't matter. When this action is zero, then it's completely ad hoc. It's so far completely ad hoc. Completely ad hoc. So we're trying to play some tricks. And then at the end of this, you will see what. Yeah. So far, just completely ad hoc. Uh, we could as well, by the way, have just you know put a sharp cut off. Okay, but we're going to want to differentiate things, and it's hard to differentiate with a sharp cut off. That's why. I think this. Okay, so this defines a cut off path Okay, uh, as as was commented, the action is completely ad hoc. Just a definition at the moment. We will see what uh, what uh, what. How we will use it. The thing to notice, of course, is that it, the action reduces to what the problem we actually want to solve at low enough limit. Okay, and we will in the end have a, uh, well, yes. Now uh, we define this action with some cutoff, with this lambda, and you might wonder 
you know, what value should we choose for this one? Uh, as was pointed out, there's, a, there's action, you know, maybe in some physical problem there's an action that one. Then you can scale so. The whole philosophy of our, our approach is that we don't want to use information about what's going on at very high scales in the real physical. So what value of lambda will be, will be convenient for our analysis? Basically, there's no distinguished value of lambda. Anything we do should work at all. At all. And so now there comes an interesting question. The, the question that comes about is the following. Suppose we define Z to be Uh, suppose we define Z to be um, V phi exponential of T to the power minus S of phi lambda plus integral J phi. I included a source term here, this J source term, so that if I want to compute not just the, the partition function, not just this integral, but correlation functions, I have all the information I need. Okay, I have all the information I need. Um, uh, uh, so, so that I, I can differentiate. Okay. Now maybe I'll choose actually this k function to be let's let's choose it like this. Okay. Let's say that k from zero to one is just one. From two onwards is just zero. And then smoothly interpolate in, in an infinitely differential way, interpolate it. Okay? And then everything I do. I will choose my source function. So it has non-zero support in momentum space. Only below lambda. Okay? So my sources are put in the part of the problem which is unaffected by this by this cutoff. Okay, so this is my Z of J. Now, a question that you could ask is the following. Suppose I uh, I take the Z of J and lambda. Okay? Suppose I take this uh, uh, Z of J and lambda and I differentiate it with respect to lambda. That's I change lambda. Okay? Will it change Z of I mean does this Z depend on this capital lambda? And of course it does. For instance, if you change lambda, change lambda from a very high number to a smaller number, this graph, which is very high, very large, then lambda is a very large number, but it becomes smaller. So smaller. Okay. But now, we can ask the following question due to Wilson. Wilson asked the following, or Kenneth Wilson asked the following question. Suppose I do, I, I do the following thing. I take this guy and also make the the rest of the Lagrangian and also make it a function of lambda in such a way that this partition function is independent. Is that possible to do? And if it is possible to do, how exactly is it? You understand the question? We've got a cutoff. We want to change the cutoff but also change the interaction part of the Lagrangian in such a way that this partition function, or more precisely, this partition function divided by uh, z of zero. So more correlation functions. Okay? Are independent of lambda. Okay? I'm going to try to solve the problem of finding whether it's possible to change this kind of function of lambda to achieve that, and if so, how it has to change in order for that to be achieved. This is a question I've set, set to ask myself. Okay? You might wonder why I'm asking this question. Hang on for a minute. The point of this will come eventually. Okay. So, let's see. Um, let's first do some simple algebra. So, what we want is that this thing is independent of so we want. So, let me take d by d lambda of so we want the 0, which is d by d lambda. That hand side is equal to d by d lambda to right hand side. And so now it's d by d lambda to the right hand side. See, d by d lambda, where does lambda enter the right hand side? It enters in this action. And it enters in two places. Okay? The first place is it enters because k is a function of lambda. The second place is that it enters because l is a function. 
So uh, this object here is the expectation value. Expectation value meaning path integral with this downstairs step in action. Of what? Uh, phi of b m squared plus b squared by 2 phi of minus b. Then b by d uh, lambda of k plus. That's the first term. Okay, um, there's a minus sign because we're doing it to the power minus s. Okay? And then because of this minus sign, there's no minus sign here, but we write plus, of course. That is uh, dl by d lambda. Choose to establish this fact. 
is, is the following. So, so what is the claim? The claim is that if we put this in here, we find that it's equal to zero. That's the claim. Right? So, so the, the, the claim restatement is that what we want to show is that d phi of exponential of minus s sub plus j phi of this whole thing minus phi uh, yeah. Uh, the expectation of IP phi minus p is just uh, uh, one upon the square of this Anyways, the other term is no, 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 no. no. Expected phi p phi minus p is one upon square plus p square is true in the free thing. Okay. okay, we get contributions from all phi. Okay. So this is some complicated thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, here have I wondered, have I forgotten about some two pies? The two pies will be this. Yeah, I forgot about the two pies. Um, okay. So, uh, so. Uh, so suppose we choose minus phi of p uh, squared plus p squared by 2 pi of minus p lambda d by d lambda k inverse of p squared by lambda squared uh, by 2 pi of 4. Okay. Um, uh, plus all of this. We want to show that this is zero, or more precisely, that uh, uh, it's zero up to uh, up to a term that can be absorbed into some This expression for Yes, this is a choice. No, I'm saying that this is necessary in order that this equation. So this is like naturally assumption and you're saying that you need to I'm going to derive this. I'm just giving you the answer. Huh? And we're going to derive the answer. Uh, I'm saying that if you choose d by d, la, d by d lambda to obey this equation, then I'm claiming that this will be true. I'm going to derive that. Okay? So in order that z of lambda be independent of lambda, that's correlation functions computed from this path and type would be independent of lambda, you have to change your interaction with Ramjit as a function of lambda according to this equation. That's it. It's a flow equation for this for this interaction with Ramjit. Uh, I think you agree that this, this is one of the possible changes that you can do or is it clearly that this is the only possible change you can do that No, it will be unique. Really unique. Yeah. Yeah. The game is that this, uh, of course you could, my, uh, you know, you might be able to do some other maybe trivial things. But it's essentially unique. It's essentially unique. And you'll be able to change the constant part of the Lagrange. Because that isn't out of the. Yes. Is it the inverse of this? I mean, the property to look at? Yeah. Yeah. The first term and the first term. In this? Yeah, they are inverse of each other. Okay. Yeah, if there is a reason, we'll see. Yes. Uh, okay. So now, before we get to interpreting uh, and so on, let's derive this. So, as I said, we're going to start with the, the, with the fact that the integral of a total derivative vanishes. Um, <coughs> so, the total derivative that will prove useful for us here is the following. Consider d four b by uh, D for P lambda D by D lambda. Lambda of D K by D lambda D squared by lambda squared. Oh. 
Okay, this then integrated d phi d by d phi of phi of p a inverse p square by now that's what plus half by 4 by p squared and lambda uh, m squared p by p 5 minus p. all of these derivatives uh, this whole thing multiplied by e to the power minus s plus g5 is what I mean that This is d lambda by d, dk by d lambda. So d lambda, lambda. Yeah, wait. Uh, sorry. This, suppose I just look at this object. In where? Multiply this part later. Later on, let me just evaluate the function. The function. 
So this is d5, del by del phi of i I'll take that derivative later. Phi of p k plus of p squared plus lambda squared plus half two phi to four p squared plus half squared. And then what do we get from here? From here we get, you see, remember what s was, right? Uh, or minus s was minus 5p p squared plus m squared k inverse uh, by 2. Uh, because there are two phi's, the by 2 goes away. So this term here is uh, uh, Problem is not enough place. Uh, because of this camera is talking. Um, okay, I'll just write it up to you. Um, okay. Okay, so where were we? We have this term, multiply something, I'll just write this bracket. This bracket, this bracket is equal to phi of, we differentiate equal to minus p phi of p, k inverse of p squared by lambda squared. Um, and uh, uh, phi of p, k inverse of p squared. Okay, you forgive me if I don't put the two pi's, the two pi's will all work out again. So okay, it's, <laughs> it's too much to keep track of. <laughs> Okay. Uh, phi of p k inverse of p squared by lambda squared. Okay, uh, times minus half. Okay, actually, let me because I put the two pi here. So the two pi. Uh, times right here, right here. Right, right, right. Okay, that's one term. And the second term is plus dl delta l by delta phi of minus p. Why did I get the factor of half? Because it was a half. Oh, sorry. So you take two. So the half. Yeah, right. This is just minus. That that half is just minus. Yeah, right. Thank you. Okay. Now let me multiply. Uh, I also have a jeta okay, good. But, but, I am uh, going to do this derivative in P here at some value of P where there's no J. Then you remember that uh, we have this K function that will take that. I'm going to make sure that my P is somewhere here. Not all my J's are here, so you don't have to worry. Okay, good. Okay. Now, now, look at this. Suppose I combine together these two terms. This guy with this guy is the same as this term, except that it has it comes with a minus half. So it just changes the factor of this to plus half. Okay? Whereas this guy is by itself. So let's write out what we have there. We've got d phi delta by delta phi of p times half phi of p inverse of p squared by lambda squared um, plus this is this. Um, half the 2 pi to the power 4 by p squared plus m squared delta L by delta phi of minus P times e to the power minus this. Okay, is that clear? Now I have to take the second function. Is this clear? Okay, okay. Now I have to take the second functional derivative. So the second functional derivative has two terms. One term here is this acting on this. Uh, it has three kinds of terms. 
One term here is this, acting on this. That term is an insertion inside the path integral independent of phi. So once we do that integral over p here, it's just proportional to the path integral itself. That is telling you that apart from everything else we do, we will also have to rescale the path integral. Okay? Rescaling were not counted as significant, so I'm going to forget about that. So of course we can try it. Not So okay. So only terms which have high dependence somewhere matter. <coughs> okay. Another way of saying it is that what we've not kept track of, that in addition to this rescaling of the Lagrangian, there's also a rescaling of the constant term of the Lagrangian. Cosmologically constant term, which rescales the whole path of the Lagrangian. We're not keeping track of that. Okay? So this term I know. Now, there are two other kinds of terms. There's a term where this d by d phi gets this L. Or there's the term where the d by d phi gets the minus S. Okay? Let's look at each of these two terms. Um, let's first look at the term where the d by d phi hits the minus s. That term is just half the d phi half phi of b a inverse of d squared plus d squared. Okay, plus two pi. Uh, 4, 2, d squared plus n squared, dl by d by d by Okay? Sorry. Times, sorry, sorry, yes? So I actually understand that when you are So, 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 see, suppose you had this if L phi, okay, in addition to changing L by this way, if you have to change it by some constant, some constant that's independent of phi, what will that do to the, to the partition function? So just give me an overall rescaling of the partition function. This is a triviality because it cancels between numerator and denominator. It cancels between numerator and denominator in computing correlation functions. Okay? Such a term here could be absorbed into su such a shift. Okay? Any change, any change like this that is phi independent can be absorbed into such a shift and is not being kept track. I could have kept track of it, just being lazy. Okay. Change the renormalization equation to include this constant piece. Okay? But I'm only keeping phi independent pieces. Is this clear? Okay. Now, let's look at this. So we have this times this guy acting on this. This guy acting on this we just worked out here, right? It was this. Okay, so this is, uh, let's pull an overall factor of this uh, <coughs> m squared plus p squared, uh, m squared plus p squared by 2 pi to the 4 out. So that uh, is, uh, m squared plus p squared by 2 pi to the 4 times Uh, 
belas uh, ah, that's two here, that's it, right. So let's take a, a half out of it. Uh, plus uh, uh, two pi four p squared plus n squared del del and del. That's what we worked out, right? There are two terms. There's the term from this, the third piece and this piece. Right? And this is Is this clear? Okay? Now the important point, and this is why we chose everything the way we did. The important point is that well, this appears with this plus this. This appears with this minus, you know, minus this plus this. Okay? So what we've got, apart from the fact that there's a P goes to minus P, which doesn't matter because we're doing an integral. Okay? So P is a double variable. So under the integral sign, it doesn't matter. This is basically of the sign from A plus B into A minus B. Okay? So uh, you can check that by doing the appropriate change of variable, the cross terms cancel. Okay? So this expression here becomes um, m squared plus b squared by 2, 2 pi or 4 times d pi of Um, 2 pi to the power 4 by p squared plus p squared um, square del l by del pi of p del l by del pi of minus p. Okay, minus uh, pi of p pi of minus p times k plus square 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 yes when you're doing the derivative with the term within the square bracket the first time you're neglecting because the, that's a fine limit yes why are you neglecting the second time so not not neglecting that's not complete there are three things there's this hitting this there's this hitting this which is not and there's this hitting this Okay, now let us also write down the the, the term that you wanted, um, which was uh, this hitting this. I'm clearing this part. Hope I've kept my signs. It's okay. But anyway, uh, so this hitting this will be plus two pi to the power four. Okay, that was this. Um, okay, since we've got this, we've got this overall two pi. Uh, we've got an overall two half out here. We've got uh, two pi to four. So this will be plus if we yeah uh, two pi to the power four by p squared plus m squared uh, the whole thing square d two l by d pi of c, d pi of c, as we said. And of course, here is minus s. e to the power minus s. Okay. Great. So, this was the path integral part of that object. But what we actually wanted, what we actually wanted was to multiply this path integral part by uh, dk by d lambda, or lambda dk by d lambda, and, and integrate over all, all the way. Um,
where, where did we lose it? We lost somewhere. Yeah. Where we actually wanted was to multiply uh, this by dk by d lambda and integrate over all the So now, so the thing that is actually zero is uh, uh, this multiplied by lambda d by d lambda uh, k and integrate the over all This we have, we see is equal to zero.
But that is exact. But that is exactly what we wanted to prove. You remember what we wanted to prove? We wanted to prove that if we replace this del L by del lambda by this expression, we would get zero. So you remember what we wanted to prove? I hope that was fine. Apart from the sign. Um, we wanted to prove that, you see, we want to prove that d by d lambda, lambda d by d lambda of z of lambda was zero. D, lambda d by d lambda of z of lambda two times. One was minus d by d lambda acting on the k function. Or the k inverse function. That was exactly this, so that we don't have the minus. Do we have the minus? No, we don't have the minus. Okay. Uh, the second term was, uh, ah, lovely, this minus sign is this. Beautiful. Okay, it's what you put aside. So the second term was d l by d lambda. Okay, so let me multiply this whole thing by minus. Minus and minus, because something is zero with minus and minus zero. Okay, we've shown that this is zero, but this is precisely d by uh, lambda d by d lambda of z. The first term was here, where the actual of the k inverse. And the second term was d by d l l. But we assume that d by d l is this. Is this clear? I'm sorry, the algebra is a bit hairy. Uh, it's the kind of thing that's harder to explain in class than to work out in paper. Just because you can't write everything on one line. So. Okay? But look, what we've done, you see we managed, not bad. We managed in 20 minutes. Uh, we got the signs right, we got two pies right. <laughs> Better than I expected. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay? So you say that, so, so now, uh, any questions or comments about it? So it seems to me that the fourth pi, the fourth pi of E outside doesn't play a role. No, no, it did play a role. Uh, it played a role in, you remember we got this A plus B plus minus B? Yes. That really wasn't really A plus B plus minus B. It was A of P plus B of P in, into A of minus P times B of minus P. Okay. Okay? The vanishing of the cross terms in that expression required the integral. Yes. Uh, any uh, uh, any other questions? The initial answer that we started out with, like when you took the total derivative to zero, was that at all, or was that influenced by the form of that? No, no. We, that you see, what we want is something like this. We want to find that, that this term plus something will give us zero. Whatever the plus something is, we will identify with uh, the L by the lambda. Okay? Since we have proved this, if I was to present it logically, what I would have done is start with the total, never tell you what anything is. I would have started with the total element. Okay? Deduce this formula. And then notice that, therefore, if we chose dl by d lambda to be this quantity, z of lambda remains in it. Yes. How did we get there? That's by, by guessing. Okay. Yeah. We wanted some total derivative that would include this piece plus something else. That was what we wanted. And we fooled around, you know, that, that, that was a creative guess. Of course, actually, we know the answer. Uh, I, I, I'll explain to you in two minutes how diagrammatically you do what you can say. Okay, I, I, I'll explain that in two minutes. But, uh, but, uh, uh, okay, maybe I should explain that. See, this, this, this change of integer is very intuitive. You see, because by changing lambda, what are we doing? What we've got is a path integral where, where instead of integrating over all momenta, now we're integrating over a smaller integer momenta. We're doing this in a smooth way. But if for a moment you allowed me to make a cut off this k function sharp, then the change in lambda essentially means that the original Lagrangian had an integration over a small momentum shape between lambda and lambda plus d lambda that the new path integral does not have. Okay? So, what should the new Lagrangian be? Suppose I did this infinite. So, for a moment, suppose that 
that we were using a power of the many bits. Okay, just to see this clearly. Uh, if I change lambda, and I wanted the path integral not to be changed, not to be affected, what I have to do is to do the integral over phi of p from lambda minus d lambda to lambda. Now that integral is going to change the action as a function of phi of p for phi of, for p less than lambda. Okay? How will you do it? You see, doing the integrals can be done using phi integrals. It's just performing a Gaussian, uh, some sort of uh, Gaussian kind of integration. Okay? Now, suppose we've got some Lagrangian in. We want to do this integral. There are essentially two kinds of diagrams that we contribute when we remember that we're doing an integral of really, very infinitesimal moment. The two types of diagrams that contribute is one. Is one that suppose I've got some legs in an interaction term with One thing that can happen is that you can close the legs. What do I mean by that? I, you see, I had in the action a Lagrangian in which phi went over all momentum ranges. Okay, it went over the momentum ranges here, which I call low. And it went over the momentum, this infinitesimal momentum range here, which I call high momentum. Now we want to do the integral over phi over high momentum. Okay? So if I had insertion of two phi high momentum, I do this integral, that's given by these phi numbers. The phi, the answer it produces is, a, is an object with two phi is less. With two fives less, okay, times whatever you get by doing the integral here over this momentum, over the high momentum. What is this term that somebody identifies this term in that? This term. You knock out two of the fives, okay, then you multiply with the propagator. And you do the integral. Now, the fact that we, have, we get this instead of just integral lambda to lambda plus d lambda is the fact that we've got a smooth cut. Okay? So, this term here is simply such diagrams. The other thing that will happen is this. You have two lambda, the Rangian factor, and you do a tree exchange with high momentum. If you know, which term is that here? This, this, and um, and the this here. Okay. Now you can ask, why not diagrams like this? Why not, for instance, you know, more complicated diagrams? Why not a diagram like uh, this times maybe this? Can anyone give me an answer? Remember, this is integral. You see, exactly, each of these these graphs, when you do a loop of is proportional to the phase space over which you're doing the delta one, over which you're doing the loop. If you do two such integrals, you've got two factors of this, but infinitesimally, those are subleading. Okay? So you can easily convince yourself that at the infinitesimal order, these are the only two kinds of graphs that come And they give these two terms. So what you are doing, is integrating out the fields at high momentum. That changes the action to the field at low momentum. And the great thing is that you can do this, uh, that you can do this very simply, because aided by the fact that you're only doing an infinitesimal momentum effect by that at a time. Okay? So we've got a rigorous derivation, rigorous non-perturbative derivation of this thing. But this equation if you'd asked any reasonable physicist, he would have told you what the answer was before finding the derivation. Because the way clearly that Wilchinsky got the answer first is by integrating out the shells. And then he had to find some sophisticated argument to make it some. <laughs> okay? So, it's a very intuitive answer. Is this clear? Okay. So, fair question, why you chose that? You know, you knew what you wanted to get. 
Tom. Great. Sir, if we have a room packet reader, that is also like a higher order. Yes, yes. Both. The, both proportional to. Uh, you see, in this. Um, you see, in this. Uh, um, In this sharp cutoff way, this tree level guy is a bit about Because it only contributes when these momenta are poised so that the intermediate momentum will lie inside that shape. That's one of the advantages of the smooth cutoff. That, that contributes over a range of momenta, but its contribution is proportional to the data. So these two are very easy. Okay. Uh, any other questions about this? Okay, great. So we derive this equation. This equation has, has a name. It's called the exact renormalization group equation. It's a beautiful equation. Unfortunately, there's been no analog of this uh, this equation uh, for, let's say, uh, there is well, not really gauge fields. It would be sort of nice to have an exact renormalization group in your the gauge theories. Um, and we discuss as we go along one of the, obst the obstacles of finding such. But for a theory of a pure scalar field, there is, of course, you can generalize to many scalar fields, and so on. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a very beautiful, clean, exact equation. Okay. Now, at the next step of analysis, we, what we're going to try to do is to try to understand. Okay, so we've got this nice equation. So far, of course. Uh, for most of you, this is totally unmotivated. Who cares if we have this equation? What does it have to do with the original problem we have to solve? I sympathize with that question. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. So now I'm going to rub out everything on the board except the equation. Okay? So we forget about the derivation. We look at the answer. What is the structure of this answer? This answer is a first, this object is a first order differential equation. Let's, let's call lambda is uh, e to the power t. So e by d lambda. Lambda t by d lambda. Is equal to e by d lambda. Okay. So in renormalization group flow, sort of quote unquote time, this is nothing to do with time and space. Just observing it. Um, this is a first order differential equation. What's its structure? It's a structure that tells you that if I know what L is at any given time, I will, I will predict what L is at every future time. Is this clear? It's like an evolution equation. Notice that the right hand side depends only on L at that time. It doesn't depend explicitly on time. There are no explicit factors beyond that. Okay? Um, right. K. That's true. There's a K. Uh, 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 okay. It's true. 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 Uh, okay. Sorry. I said that wrong. There is an explicit factor of lambda in K, which, as we will see, is basically true. <laughs> Uh, in the non-trivial part of this. No, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're right. There is an explicit factor there uh, in, the, in, the, in that case. Uh, in this part, there isn't. And that will be enough for what we need. As we call it. Okay. Um, so, this is an equation that tells you if you know you're, in, you're at some time what your advantage is, you can predict it in the future. And suppose you take in your future meaning lower scales, lower lambda. Now suppose you take in your Lagrangian. Okay, uh, maybe I should have. So that 
increasing times decreases. Okay, so uh, suppose you know your Lagrangian. Suppose you know your Lagrangian at some time, and it's a very simple Lagrangian. That's just phi to the fourth. At later times, we're going to generate phi to the sixth terms because this term here will generate a phi to the sixth. Then once we're generating the phi to the sixth term, we'll also generate phi to the eighth terms, phi to the tenth terms, and so on as we keep going. Moreover, this term will feed back on the phi to the four terms. Okay? Also, the Lagrangian you started with could have had very simple momentum dependence. It was just local, integral phi to the four. Well, because of all these factors of momentum floating around, we will generate very complicated momentum dependences, which in position space will involve higher derivative terms in the action. Okay? So it's clear from the structure of this equation that no matter what you try to do initially, if you care about the structure of the action at all times, there is no particular simplification. It's not consistent to assume that the action takes some particular truncated form. That's just inconsistent with the Van Hansen's equation. Okay? So you so our action as we flow in this space is going to be arbitrarily complicated. That's how we uh, have a way of parametrizing. Let's work in momentum space, okay? So let's say that phi of x is equal to it is by phi of x by four uh, phi of b. Okay? Suppose we take this action here. Uh, sorry, this definition of uh, the Fourier transform. This is what we've been using all along. Okay? Uh, L, this interaction phi, can be expanded first in the data series as a number of phi sessions. Okay? So sum over N, L, N of phi, where L, N of phi is equal to some. Uh, uh, Gn coefficient n p1 p2 pn delta function two pi of four times delta function p1 plus p2 pn and pi of p1 pi of pn. Okay. It's the most general form it can take, and there's no reason the selection won't take this most general form for arbitrarily complicated functions of, of the same. Okay, the one thing though that we know is that because if we don't start with anything crazy, the things that will be generated will always have derivative expansion. Okay? Because we're always working with derivative cutoff. And we work. You see, everything here can be expanded. In, uh, in a power series, a moment. So these expressions, these, these terms, wherever they are, will admit a Taylor series expansion in uh, P's. Okay? So one way of parametrizing these is to set one of these momenta to be determined by momentum conservation. And uh, Taylor series expand this as uh, uh, A, N1, N2, N, N minus 1. Uh, P1 to the power N1, P2 to the power. Actually, probably N, P1 uh, N2 to the power. Actually, we should have kept track of the mu in this case as well here. Because these P's are momenta. Okay, so N1 mu1 to the power, N1 mu1, and so on. Why do you take that expansion? I mean, are you saying it's like, are you saying that uh, it's uh, even truncated data series or just that there is a related by expansion? No, no, I'm just saying, I'm not saying you're trying to truncate the data series. I'm just saying that there is no obstruction to performing data series. That is, there's no non analyticity That's all. Okay, because, yeah, because 
All we're doing is we all you know we we're gender we're getting momentum dependence from these propagators. Okay. And they all have support only in the range of momentum we're doing the integral, which is powerful. That's basically. Okay? So uh, P1 mu uh, 1 to the power n 1 mu 2. Yeah. So what I do is writing down some parametrization of these functions. Just what these indices mean? What these indices mean? So suppose you've got p1 p1 mu 1 to the power n 2, p2 mu 2 to the power n 2. The coefficient of that term I call a n 1 mu 1 a 2. I've got this function, which is a function of p1, p2, p3 up to p n minus 1. It's not a function of p n because so what are mu's and mu's are uh, uh, n's are the order of n. No, no. Uh, n is just yeah, how, how many p's yeah. come. Yeah? Many? Mu's are the vector indices. p1, p2, p3. Uh, this perfectly has to be Lorentzian. This has to be Lorentzian. It's true. So it, it, it has to be in such that these are all Lorentzian variant tensors. Okay. So uh, we could try to parameterize that more seriously. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about what I'm saying. Okay. All I wanted to do was to notice that the data in this function is in terms of an infinite number of numbers. The infinite number of numbers are the various data coefficients or variants for all n. So there's some high but discrete infinity number of numbers, the various Taylor expansion coefficients of each of these things, that completely characterize this. This this end. Now, one thing that's of interest to me is to find the scaling dimension, to find the, uh, the engineering dimension, the dimension of each of these numbers. Okay. As far as the dimension goes, the only thing that matters is how many different NLPs you have. Okay. So as Mangesha, this I've not been careful in my parameterization. I should put Lorentz and Lorentz. But none of that's going to matter. I'm going to do it. Let's suppose that this, that the coefficient, that we've got a coefficient which is a n, which means number of files, and d, which means total number of derivatives, total number of p factors. Okay, I want to know what the dimension of that coefficient is. So let's do some calculation. The dimension of phi of x, as you all know, is one. You see this from the kinetic d phi the whole thing squared. That's d4x has to be dimension this, so phi is dimension. That's the dimension of phi x. That means that the dimension of phi p is equal to minus three. Because phi of p d4p is phi of x. So the dimension of phi of p plus 4 must be the dimension of phi of x. Okay? Now this term here enters this Lagrange. So the, the, the term with n phi's appears in a Lagrangian with firstly n minus one momentum momentum integrations. N minus one because it's no problem. Either. Okay. So let's so the di so we have dimension of a n comma d whatever it is. So uh, plus all the dimensions of the momentum integrations. Okay? The dimensions of the momentum integrations are n minus 1 times 4. Plus the dimensions of the phi's. So plus n times minus 3. Plus the dimensions of the explicit factors of momentum. Okay? Plus d is equal to 0. Because the whole Lagrangian is dimensionless. If any term has dimensions, that is absorbed in the dimensions, it's coefficient. Okay? Is this equation here? Dimension of coefficient plus dimension of the integration factors plus dimension of the uh, explicit dimension associated with each phi of p plus dimension associated with each of the derivatives is equal to zero. Each of the moment factors is equal to zero. So this tells us. 
this time last, that A of N B uh, A of N D is equal to minus four minus N. Plus four minus D. So all of the minus N Let's suppose n was equal to 4 and b was equal to 0, so we had an ordinary phi to the 4 interaction. That should be dimensionless for dimensions and it is. Or the kinetic term, n equals 2, b equals 2, is dimensionless, it is. The mass term, n equals 2, d equals 0, should have dimension 2. This, this formula works. Okay? Think about this. The thing to note about this formula is that almost all of these quantities have a negative. All, almost all of these coefficients have a, have a negative dimension. Okay. Which ones don't? The only ones that don't are the kinetic terms, the mass term, and phi. To, let's suppose we're dealing with a theory where you've got phi goes to minus phi. So we can never generate odd number of phi. So the only ones that don't have a bit kinetic term. So, so there's n is equal to 2, uh, t is equal to 0, that's mass. n is equal to 2, t is equal to uh, 2. You can't have d equals 1 thing, right? That's kinetic term. And n is equal to 4, d is equal to 0. That's fine. These are the only terms that you can write down in the graph. Okay? That have where full coefficient can appear and does appear in this in the solving of this equation is one of these equations. Momentum scale to the power 4 minus n minus d. 
Now this would be the effective parameter. The effective parameter that determined how important uh, that A and D was in the answer answering the question that was happening in momentum scale P. Okay? And then you might have concluded that since this um, uh, oh, sorry, I, I need to find some. Okay, and then you might have concluded that uh, uh, since this number was negative for most of these guys, if you take uh, sorry, since this number now is positive for most of these guys, <coughs> if you take p goes to zero, the limit of low energies, most of these characters will have no effect on anything. At low energy compared to, you know, the scale set by these, by these numbers. The point about the analysis that we've 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 we've, we've, we've done so far is that this this is too naive. This is too naive because there is one more dimension scale in the problem we really now, which is the cutoff. Okay, and uh, if we're interested, if we're in a theory. With momentum scale cut off lambda, some scale is going to a measure of p, and there's a big gap between p and lambda. Okay? Then the dimensionless combination that appears here could well be a and d times lambda to the power, rather than a and d times p to the power. Since lambda is much bigger than p, these quantities could make an anomalous, anomalously large contribution to any physical effect. That is not seen by dimension analysis. Okay? Because there's a new dimension scale in the problem. Didn't you? Now, Wilson's main idea, Wilson's main idea was, suppose we take this renormalization group seriously. And we actually, if we're interested in some process of momentum scale P, let's actually do the integral. Run your Lagrangian so we lower the cutoff down to momentum scale of order P. Okay? Then, whether you non dimensionalize these A's with lambda or P, it's more or less the same thing because they're the same order. So then, A times P is a fair measure of the effect of this term on physics. Okay? There is no hidden dimension large number, namely the number of lambda divided by p in your problem. Okay? So the idea was that if you are interested in doing a calculation at scale p, um, it is useful to work with the Lagrangian where that the cutoff is approximately, it could be twice speed, but approximately momentum scale. Okay? And once you've done that, this is a fair estimate of the effect of such parameters on your physics. Okay? Since we are going to, since we are going to, uh, uh, since this is the attitude we are going to take, um, in dealing with these parameters, okay, five minutes I'll stop. Um, in dealing with these parameters, in these dealing with these various parameters, we will choose, instead of dealing with these parameters, we will choose to deal with parameters A and D times lambda to the power minus 4 plus N plus Let's call these guys X and These are dimensionless numbers. These are the guys that determine the, that are a fair measure, a fair measure of the impact of these parameters A and B on physics at a particular scale. Then we got scale lambda. Okay? So, one program might be the following. One program might be the following. Take this equation here and rewrite it as a set of flow equations for the numbers X and D. Okay? Now, what do these flow equations look like? Uh, as we have seen, almost all of these x, okay, so what do these flow equations look like? So suppose we write down 
d by d lambda, lambda d by d lambda of, of, of this family. Yeah? Because of this explicit factor of lambda, we get lambda d by d lambda uh, of x n d is equal to uh, n plus. Uh, now, um, yeah, let, let me do. Let me uh, do what I said before. So I'll call lambda is e, e to the power of and look at the flow towards the infrared. Flow positively. So d by dt of x in d is equal to uh, minus of n plus d minus 4 of x in d. Okay, that's just a trivial part because we made this, this redefinition. And then plus whatever we get, uh, plus whatever we get from here. Plus 
a bolt. Okay? This is a beautiful kind of equation. Every quantity here is dimensionless. The, no, the information of dimensions are all going into this one. The, this one object. Uh, this equation, the first term I can understand because as you increase t, the first term becomes more and more uh, irrelevant. The x yes. becomes more and more irrelevant. Yes. But the second term is not that simple because. Uh, it's whatever it is. It comes out of here, right? You just expand this one. Yes. It's not like that. Not you get something. Yes, but that can be, uh, as you increase t, that might actually make x. So it might. It might. Right. No, 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 we're going to analyze it. Okay. But this is the structure of these equations. Okay, you guys, oh yeah, are you exhausted? Do you have something to do? Can I take any more? Sure. No, I, I, I got one shirt, I'm not exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and someone want to cast the casting boat. <laughs> that we were deciding boat. Uh, let, unless somebody says, okay, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, I can't absorb anymore. We just go on again. Because actually one semester is a very short amount of time. Uh, to discuss a subject as fast and interesting and intriguing as quantum field theory. Okay? So let's give ourselves a little extra time for our discussions. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, okay. Now we've got, it, we've got these equations like this. And what we want to do is to understand oh, what we want to do is to understand these how these equal, what these these flow equations look like. Okay, so now we're going to follow Pulchinski. This is of course an infinite dimensional set of equations. This is an infinite number of variables. But many of the important features, conceptual features of this equation can be seen in a toy model involving two such variables. As we have already, already remarked, and as we will see in more detail as we go along, uh, variables come in two sorts. There are the marginal and relevant ones, and then there are the irrelevant ones. So we will make a toy model of these flow equations where we keep only one marginal direction and one irrelevant. Okay? And analyze that toy model and we'll see many of the features that are of interest to us. Um, let me do this analysis because we're going to get to the punchline. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I can see x and d is uh, in lambda or something where lambda has been taken. That dt of x and d gives, I can see the first term, I can't see the second term. The second term is what I can get from here. Uh, what you do is, uh, what you're supposed to do is to plug in what this Lagrangian is. Okay. In terms of the a and b's. Not that much using. Using this definition. Plus that in, yeah. you get some right hand side. Yeah. No, we're not even going to explicitly work it out. Explicitly, that's a horrible mess. Okay? This is the best way to write that equation. But you can see that the structural form is this. Is this clear? That's all we are saying. Okay? Actually, the way I've written it here, uh, structurally, you get uh, bilinears. And linear terms. Okay? So, structurally, look very simple. That, that, will, that hides the fact that there are an infinite number of variables. So, if you try to integrate something. Yeah. It's not, it's a complicated nonlinear system. Okay? So, now, in order to get a feel for all these, the flows of these, these quantities, in order to get a feel for the flows of these quantities, we're going to follow Wilczynski and analyze a simple topic. So suppose we get just one object of dimension 4, we call that x4. Or one object of dimension 6, we call that x6. For instance, it will be the final for one thing and the final six. OK? Then the flow equations now are d by dt of x4 is equal to beta 4 of x4 and x6. And d by dt of x6 equal to minus 2x6 plus beta 6 of x4. Now 
Okay. Now, if we look at these two flow equations, okay, what we're going to do is 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 the following. What we're going to do is the following. You see, suppose we have this x4 and x6 case. Let's say x4 is here, x6. We start somewhere in the space. This flow equation generates some sort of line. I don't know what it is, but say so We start here. Flow equations generate some line. We start somewhere else, and the flow equation generates some other line. Okay. Start somewhere else, we get another line. What we're going to demonstrate is that under appropriate circumstances. These flows are convergent flows. That is, these renormalization group flow lines tend to a single, you know, all converge on a single line if we wait for it. Okay? Of course, this whether this happens or not will depend on the details of the whole so we will then find explicit conditions under which happens. Okay? Now, uh, yes. So, 
In order to understand this phenomenon, what I want to do, what I want to do is the bar. I will try to study this phenomenon, but for infinitesimal changes of the initial initial conditions. Okay? So what would this mean physically It means that these row lines are much But how would you So x x four is what x four is the presence. It indicates presence of pi four kind of terms, and x six the presence of pi six kind of terms. Exactly. 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 And then uh, when you start with an x six which is zero or to begin with, yes. it means that there is no x six contribution. No, no, it doesn't mean that there is no x six. We start with the x six zero. Yeah. X six doesn't. It's not zero. No, no. But uh, that is generated with the uh, over time, right? The contributions, right? And then it's Okay. No, but it doesn't mean it's a zero. Yeah. Sorry. It, it just means it just means that uh, we will okay. explain this in detail. Let's first understand the phenomenon yeah. and look at the implication. Yeah. That's the main point of it. Sorry. But it means that um, that uh, it means that we have a one pattern inside of the case. Let's uh, let's understand this. Okay, let's let's wait wait, wait for this. First, let's just understand the properties of these rows and let me understand what it means. Okay? So, is what I'm going to try to do is clear. I'm going to try to study different flows parameterized by initial values, which are x6 equals 0 and x4 not 0. This is an arbitrary choice, okay? Some one parameter set of initial conditions. Chosen these initial conditions because it's what we usually do when we study to normalize. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is to vary those initial conditions infinitesimally. And once I vary those initial conditions, I'll also vary the time of flow. So as to ensure that both flows sit in the same x form. And then once I do that, I will then study the change in x6 as a function of time. And we write down an equation for that change in x6. That is our game. Any questions or comments on this? We'll see. We'll see. That's the point of the analysis. Okay? So let's 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 go ahead and do this. So first let's write down what we're interested in. So suppose we've got some lambda for uh, which is a function of lambda for naught and it becomes x x4 which is a function of x4 naught the initial value of x4 that's this guy of t and of t and we've got some x6 which is some x which is also a function of lambda for naught and t that's one of these curves Okay. So, that's, um, uh, yeah. so we are setting t is equal to 0 for every trajectory at uh, uh, x is That's it, yes. Okay, yes, yes, that's it. We choose the convention that t is equal to 0 and the initial. Okay, so some, some, this curve here. For instance, is the is the curve that I have drawn on, that I've written on the board. Now, what I want to do is to make a variation. I want to vary both t and x4 in a way that does not change x4 at t. Okay, so I want to move to a different curve. That's this one, but also to a different time so that x4 stays the same. Okay, so I want to choose some, uh, so some delta x4 naught and delta t to ensure that this guy x4 doesn't change. Okay, that of course is a achieved if we choose delta x4 by delta x4 naught, delta x4 naught, yeah, delta x4 by delta t, delta t is equal to Under this variation, 
I want to change, uh, study the change of the variation of xx. What is the variation of xx? Kuchinsky calls it zeta 6. Delta x6. Uh, which is del x6 by del x4 naught. Delta x4 naught. Plus del x6 by delta t. Delta t. I want to study it as a function of changing x1. So eliminate delta t from this one. Okay? So zeta 6 is equal to delta x4 naught into del x6 by uh, del x4 naught minus del x6 by delta t. Uh, times del x4 by delta del x4 naught over uh, del x4 so the plus delta is minus delta that's where the minus comes right so this is our definition of zeta zeta Given a particular flow line, parametrized by x4 naught and time. About it, I define a small variation, zeta 6. What it means is given in this diagram. The change in x6 at time t, okay, where, I, where the t is the flow along the initial line. You flow a little more along the along the perturb line so as to ensure that you have the same x. Okay? That's what that zeta 6 is. Now what I'm going to try to do is to compute an equation for zeta 6. That is, I'm going to compute zeta 6 product. D by D zeta 6. What does it mean? I've got this little vector. I'm going to see how many balls are there. You're using like the difference between the two flow lines here. This is what I'm going to try to find. I'm going to try to find the conditions under which that goes to zero at large x. So the flow lines approach it. Right? Now I want to find the differential equation for zeta 6. Well, the great thing is that we're going to find the homogeneous equation. So the right hand side will find the zeta 6. So you can see. So let's do it. Just a matter of algebra. <coughs> okay, delta 4 x naught is some constant, small number, because that is not a function of time. So, what are the functions of time in this case? So, this quantity delta, uh, delta 6, delta, six uh, delta x6 by del, del t, of course, is given by our, ba our basic formulas. It's the beta. Okay, so we have written x4 dot is equal to beta 4 and x6 dot here is equal to minus 2x6 plus, uh, plus beta 6. In this algebra, it's very inconvenient to differentiate this. We call this beta 6 the combination of these two points. And then later substitute beta 6. Okay. So, zeta 6, let's first try to get a formula. Zeta 6 is equal to delta x4 naught into del x. 6 by del x4 naught plus beta 6 over beta 4. That's del x4. Okay, this is the definition of beta of, of zeta. And now what I want to compute is zeta. In order to do that, I have to understand two, uh, two things. I have to understand how to compute beta dots, and I have to understand how to compute these thick dots. Beta dots are totally straightforward, because beta is some function of x, y, x, x. So you just take it. Okay? More, more confusing initially is this object here. It's delta x6 by delta x4 naught. How do I think of that? You see, 
Um, a way of thinking of this is, uh, is as follows. Um, suppose I've got any infinitesimal, I've got, I've got some, some flow, and I've got any infinitesimal variation around that flow. I can see how those infinitesimal variations change in time by differentiating, by, by just varying this initial. Any del, any infinitesimal change of this delta x for dot is equal to um, del beta 4 by del del x4 delta x4 plus del beta 4 by del x6 delta x6 and similarly delta x6 dot is equal to del beta 6 by del x4 delta x4 plus del beta 6 by del x6 delta x6 Obviously. Okay. Now this holds for any small variation along the given uh, around the given curve. In particular, it holds for the variation that you get by by doing a, a small change in, in the initial condition x x form. Yeah. So in particular, it applies when delta x form is equal to delta x or not, and delta x by delta x or not. Delta x6 is equal to delta x4 naught, delta x6 by delta x4 naught. These are just constants. Okay? So applying these formulas to these deltas tell us what d by dt of these quantities is. This is kept. Okay, this delta x4 is the following. 
this delta x4 is x4 of x4 naught plus delta x4 naught and p this one this one minus, minus x4 of x4 naught and p so that is t plus delta t that's right okay this formula only holds for such a variation yeah, true, yeah. we just take two trajectories okay this therefore applies to this object because this delta x4 naught is a constant okay so we conclude that del x4 by del x4 uh, not dot is equal to l beta 4 by del x4 uh, del x4 by del uh, x4 not plus del beta 4 by del x6 uh, del x6 by del x4 not and we conclude that del x6 dot by del x4 naught is equal to the same formula we will replace uh, beta 4 by beta 6 del beta 6 by del x4 del x4 by del x4 naught plus del beta 4 by del sorry, 6 by del x6 del x6 by del Okay, so we've got nice formulas for this dot function. Dot means a constant x one. The beta's for the x six and the beta three the same. A beta, everything is beta delta. Will you permit me not to write delta's all through? Okay. 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 Now that we've got all that we need, let's write down an equation. Delta six dot is equal to what? Well, it's equal to delta x four dot times. Now, one term we just get directly from here. Del beta uh, six by del x four dot times del x four minus. Plus del beta six by del x by del x six del x six by del x four not that's one term. The second term we get directly from here. Plus beta six by beta four into del beta 4 by del x4 del x4 by del x4 not plus del beta 4 by del x6 del x6 by del x4 okay and then you get what you get by differentiating these two okay and of course you just get from the chain so one term is going to be differentiate the beta 6. So del beta 6 by del x4 gets beta 4. Plus del beta 6 by del x6 times beta 6 divided by beta 4 to del x4 by del x4 naught. And then the last term we get by differentiating the beta 4, which is minus beta 6 times beta 4 squared times del beta 4 by del x4 beta 4 plus del beta 4 by del x6 beta 6 times del x4 by del x4 So the first term is del beta 4 by 
specify del x four, not del x four. The first term. Yeah. Ah, that will be del x three. That will be del x four. Thank you. Okay. Everyone happy with this formula here? Okay. Now, if we run the algebra right, it should turn out to be the case that the terms weighed can we really stop it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it should turn out to be the case that the terms with uh, uh, with del beta 6 by del x4 and del beta 4 by del x4 all that. Let's check that. Let's turn, take, look at all the terms here proportional to del beta 6 by del x4. So del beta 6 by del x4 appears here. It's del beta 6 by del x4 times del x4 by del x4 not. And can anyone see another del beta? Ah, yeah. Uh, del. Where is my minus? Where is my minus? Uh, in that zeta six formula, the second term was was minus. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we need to fix this. So let's see what what have we got wrong. This one was. Is correct. Next one was minus, minus, and plus. Okay, great. So now this term and this term cancel each other. The beta four by the beta four. Now it should also be true that del beta four by del x four terms cancel. Let's check that. Del beta 4 by del x4, one term is here. And one term is here. Beta 6 by beta 4 squared. Beta 4 uh, del x4 by del x0. Del x4 by del x0. Cancels. Right? Yes. So this term and this term. Okay. Now the other terms don't cancel. And let's see what they evaluate. Okay. The other terms don't cancel, let's see what they evaluate. You see. So let's take the term that is del beta six and del x six. What is null? It multiplies, well from here what did we get? It was, uh, of course there's an overall delta x4 naught. But from here we get del x6 by del x4 naught. Okay, so we del that term. And del beta 6 by del x6, yeah. Uh, Minus beta six by beta four del x four by del x four. Right. Similarly, what about the term that is that is del so plus del beta four by del x six. Okay. This term multiplies what? So, it's just these two terms. Um, so, this term here multiplies Uh, uh, minus beta 
Ezért nevétel koronára erről szépen, amit ezt Okay, so this is our final formula. 
Now look at this formula. What this term tells us is that zeta 6 just decays. This term tells us that there are corrections to that. Unless these corrections give you add up to some exponential factor that beats this, zeta 6 will just decay. What? Zeta 6 not. What is that 0? Zeta 6 not. Uh, no, it's not 0 because we have this trajectory and this trajectory. Yeah, the difference in a, uh, and we're supposed to change t in zeta 6 so that we get the same zeta 4. So this is what zeta 6 is. Okay. Okay? So, provided these beta functions are relatively small, this is the contribution by the way of anomaly, this will, in the quantum field theory, make anomalous variations. Provided these beta functions are sufficiently small, making perturbation theory may be guaranteed to be the case. Because they will all be suppressed by some kind. This thing goes to zero. So we've discovered this very nice property of these flow type equations. So when you've got a flow type equation which has a linear damping term, so let's summarize and then we'll continue. I won't have time for the punchline today, that will take us through. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah. So what have we discovered? We've discovered that when we've got these these linear differential equations with then one of them has this damping term. It is not true that zeta six flows to zero because of the nonlinearness. It is not even true that at large times it is necessarily very small. This is not true. What is true, however, is that the damping terms make the flow lines merge towards each other. That is true. So what that means is that if you take one parameter set of initial conditions, one parameter set of starting points, and we tune the flow times to bring x4 equal. Then x6s, then the x6s, whatever they are, it's a function of time, flow, you know, decay to zero, the difference in x6s, as we take the length time. That is the effect on these flow equations of this damping term. It is not always true. It can be overwhelmed by it is not linear. But it's true these things are small enough. Is this basic point clear? What we are going to, uh, I probably won't go through the inequality, so the people who are actually go through the proof in the quantum field theory case, I need a few minutes to think about. They're clearly written paper. It's just irritating inequality. But uh, uh, what we will now argue next time is that the same thing happens in quantum field Okay? That, basically in this infinite dimensional parameter space, all flow lines focusing on a, at least in perturbation, on a very small submanifold. Since they focus in on a very small submanifold, since they focus on a very small submanifold, okay, we can, it doesn't matter what our definition of the theory was. The details of UV physics don't, don't matter. Because as we have explained, in order to understand physics at scale lambda, it is sufficient to know the effective action at scale lambda. It is not just sufficient, it is like efficient to know. It is both sufficient and efficient. So if very widely differing starting points all flow to the same effective action up to some two parameters, in, then in order to understand what quantum field theory we are getting, we just need a labeling of this, of where we are on this two parameter set 
of attractiveness. And one way to generate that is to start on an arbitrary two-dimensional set, uh, two-parameter set in the UV. And get to this two, two Okay, And that's what we do when we study Okay, This is the thing I will try to explain to you in much more detail uh, in next class. Uh, we've got all the algebra out of the way, so the next class will be more fun. <laughs> Uh, if, suppose it's a big graphic for me, it's about minus it's plus v. It's a very good question. So uh, the question is, can you flow to the uh, UV rather than the AR? Yeah, that is a very confusing question because from the, this point of view, of course, uh, you might think, why not? Well, firstly, let's, the first thing to say about that is uh, uh, that even at the level of differential equations, it's a much better posed problem to flow to, uh, flow to the IR rather than the Okay? Because as we have seen, changes in initial conditions damp out towards the EP, but blow up towards, sorry, towards the IR, but blow up towards the EP. Okay? So it's a, uh, you know, it's a little like trying to solve the equations of hydrodynamics, discus hydrodynamics in reverse time. You will keep quickly get blowing up solutions. Okay, um, and that is basically the problem. The problem is that if you flow towards the, okay, you might well find that in finite time you reach. That you actually get uh, Let me give you an example of an equation that we need. It's an example that comes when we try, comes about when we try to study uh, the renormalization of QE. Suppose the equation is such that B by D T of one by X, you got one parameter. Quickly towards some universal flow lines. Okay? 
and uh, typically don't have any similarities except for the deep in the area. Uh, there may be more to say. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, it's, it's like the number of data computer increase. So uh, a single theory which is from the low energy is the it can actually be obtained from a number of theories in the unique, and so there's no unique theory to which it flow. Is that one? That's one way to say. However, you know, you might uh, you might ask, uh, how do we see this from our differential equations? Uh, you might ask, how do we see this from? You see, the procedure we used to generate these differential equations was clearly one of integrating. Differential equations themselves seem to allow for evolution both in forward as well as back. Okay? The signature of trouble from the point of view of the differential equations would, I believe, be similarities. We should try to solve this. We can also have a large number of operators in the low energy theory which are irrelevant. Which are irrelevant. Irrelevant. Yes. Do not open the high no, that's so, what so uh, the, that would signal that you don't have any theory with, without similarities. I mean, you, you, you can't integrate both ways. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand. I mean, you can have a large number, you can have different, you have two different theories, I mean, different numbers of irrelevant operators and low energies, and you are integrating towards the uh, UV, and you, and you get this, I mean, you, you can basically, uh, irrelevant operators will drop out. Of Irrelevant operators appear to look more and more important. Irrelevant. Irrelevant operators are operators that naively are very important at high energies, but are not important at low energies. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk more about that. Sir, can you think of the utility in terms of a reflection? Because in that case, as we go to the other way, the trajectory sort of works, right? Like, it's the Okay. 